What is going on, everybody? Portland Jake here. I wanted to give you a quick intro to this episode because this is the first time I've been able to post a, a, a either a podcast or YouTube, however you're listening or watching this, um, with a guest. And it's my good buddy, Nate Salisbury. He's an affordable advisor here in Utah with me. He has his own niche. We're going to talk about plan design in his niche. It's really interesting, and we're going to do more of these. We're going to have a lot of different guests, but hope to have Nate back again real soon because I think he's bringing a lot of value. If you have a chance, follow him on social. He's putting out a ton of good stuff. He's going by the name 401k Builder, so um, we'll talk about why that is and the industry that he's going after. Stick around. It's going to be a great episode for you. All right. Hello, Jake here. Hey, I've got a special guest today. I'm super pumped because he's, I think, one of the rising stars, especially in Utah in the 401k space. And we met, I can't remember when, last year sometime. And Nate Salisbury. Salisbury? Do I say it right? Salisbury, just like the steak. Salisbury, just like the steak. <laughs> I like that. So Nate Salisbury, he's uh, been an amazing advisor to know because I think he's really trying to put a ton of effort into bringing value and I'm really pumped every time we talk I see more and more that he's putting out for people so Nate go ahead and introduce yourself real quick and then we're going to jump into our topic today. Hey everybody so like Jake said my name is Nate Salisbury I live here in Utah I'm actually from northern Utah but I am working living and operating down in Salt Lake right now um, I'm a second generation financial advisor uh, so I've been living with this stuff my entire life um, I actually have a pretty extensive background in construction, and that's pretty much why I've decided to emphasize and work and really help construction industries, builders, contractors, and all their employees really just nail retirement. So. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's so niching down, that's something that's I'm a huge believer in um, because I think too many advisors are so broad saying, hey, I want to help anybody that has a business. Unfortunately, when you do that, you realize each business is so different. And I've had clients because, you know, from my background, I was like in the benefits world. So we had just every industry you could think of. And I do an enrollment meeting in like, you know, a Zoom meeting somewhere, this big tech company that had people all over the country. And then I'd be in a, like, I think we were there in an excavator. They, I was in like a garage doing an, an enrollment meeting. So it was just like so random trying to like understand how to best communicate and relate with these people. So, I think that niche is big right now. So tell me a little bit, like, how did you end up, or what's your background in construction? How did you end up thinking that that would be something you'd want to help 401ks be a little bit better in? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I got kind of my start in construction, geez, even before high school. So one of my best friends, uh, his dad owned a roofing company. And this is like back when I was, geez, probably 14. Um, so nice. on the weekends, we'd go out, me and him, we'd go out and he'd pay us to, you know, help him tear off shingles and flip them shingles. And, um, so I did that for a couple of years. And then as I got into college and was really trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to do, um, I got introduced to financial planning and got to, got to come and sit in with the firm and see kind of the day-to-day -day operations and really what they do and how they help people. And I was like, man, this is exactly what I want to do. I was just so attracted to it. Um, but the, the firm that I ended up with, they wanted me to get into it the same way they did, which was building their book from scratch. Uh, they weren't going to give me any handouts. And so um, as a result, I ended up moving down to Salt Lake. I worked with a, another friend that was a foreman for a construction company. We did a lot of uh, commercial builds down here, remodels uh, for, you know, some some bars, restaurants, and then did some residential stuff as well. But I was able to kind of work that job and then maybe like we'd get off one day early and I'd go out and prospect, I'd call and call businesses, try to drum up business and was able to uh, slowly work that from working construction mostly and financial advising very part-time to now doing financial planning full-time and no longer in the construction field. but. Um, met a lot of really, really cool people. Um, one of the big things that I really noticed though, as I was talking to people and, and getting into financial planning at the same time uh, and talking to these construction employees um, is they were, most of them weren't doing anything at all. Um, and if they were doing something, it definitely wasn't what they needed to be doing. Um, not because they didn't want to though. Um, anytime you would, you'd have this conversation, you could tell that this was something that they cared about they thought about, they, 
probably even stressed about. Um, and it was not for not wanting to do it, but they just didn't have the resources. They didn't have that person on their team that filled the position of helping them and teaching them really what they needed to be doing and putting things in place for, for them to act on that and, and make stuff happen. So um, as a result of that, I've, I saw just a, an awesome area to really bring value, provide a lot of help, um, and, and, and make a change to, to people that really wanted to nail this and just didn't have the opportunity to, to do it. No, I think that's true. I think I've noticed that in the few construction plans I've had, it's usually a startup because you're like you said, like they just never really had somebody tell them that they should do that. And I think it's an interesting culture within that industry because you've got, you know, the big, huge contractors and then you've got all the subs below that actually are doing all the work. And you've got a lot of, I think, movement between employees. And so a lot of times they just put that off, I found. And so understanding, the, I think, the full strategy of how to implement a plan, how to communicate to everybody, because not, like, there's just problems. Like, what do you think the key, maybe the top three problems you're seeing in a construction, that niche, in that industry, from, from a 401k and a financial planning standpoint, what are the biggest three that you would be like, you know, what we can solve these things? You know, when I first got into this, I, I thought maybe the biggest problem would be that these companies don't have a plan at all. Um, and as, as I've gotten into it more, I'm realizing that, hey, you know, these guys do have a great plan, but then you start looking at the plan design, um, almost nobody uses auto enroll. And so I think that's maybe a big one um, is these auto features, making, making participation in this plan as frictionless as possible. Um, yeah. So auto enroll, you just get put in the plan at a default rate and you get started and then you know the down the road you're like oh my gosh i've already been saving x amount and it's i haven't even noticed it's gone and so to increase that a little bit you've, you've already been started and then increasing a little bit you're like wow this is actually really easy i can do this um, yeah. probably the next one i would say is education um, and education at their level and and for everybody it's different but um you know, for some companies like these tech companies going to a nice boardroom and doing an education meeting makes a lot of sense. But for the, some of these construction companies, they don't necessarily have this nice boardroom. And so you got to be figuring out, okay, do I need to be doing Zoom calls with these guys? Or what for this demographic of this company, what's going to be the best way for me to communicate with them, to educate them, and to help them understand how to use the plan, the importance of saving, the importance of doing it now as opposed to tomorrow. Um, and then probably the third one would be plan design. Um, you know, are you using your match to incentivize your employees to, to save? Are you using a vesting schedule to incentivize your employees to stay with the company and to allow your company to grow um, so that you're not wasting resources on the match and then also on, on training them and then having them walk, walk away uh, for the next company that's going to pay them a dollar or more an hour or whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, those three things, just, just having a plan, the auto features, education, um, and then using the plan and the multitude of options to design the plan to, to best help your company grow, help your employees succeed, and help uh, the, the people that really want to save put as much away as they want to. Yeah, no, I think those are all really valid points. Um, I've noticed, you know, from an auto enroll feature, it's hit and miss. Like some companies, uh, some business owners are like, yeah, that's great. Let's do that. Uh, others are nervous because they haven't figured out how to communicate that to their staff, right? right? Their staff are living check to check sometimes. And other times you've got, you know, really good times when construction is just super hot and people are just working tons of overtime and they have lots of extra money and probably the most successful scenarios I've ran into is when you get one or two of those guys on the team, whatever, like however they're organized is a big believer in the, in the plan. And they're the ones telling their buddies, do it. you got to do this. Like you're stupid not to. If you get one of those people that work for the company that all these guys and gals like trust and listen to, like I've seen huge numbers just from that. Like it's, it's amazing. So yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a unique niche for that reason, because you can't, like you said, you can't go to a boardroom. You can't have everybody in this conference room all the time because they're out and about. Like if you do it, it's probably like 6 a.m. when they're grabbing all their stuff or they're, you know, heading out to the job site. So 
another thing, have you used text much? Like that's one thing I keep wondering in that space. Like how do you, how do you interact with them? Because I found most of them when I sit down with companies like that, it's, they don't have a computer or they don't know their password. They don't have access to their email. It's like, I spend most of my time just trying to help them get in. And if there was an easier way for them to just bounce their questions off of you, like I think it would go super, super far. Um, I don't know your thoughts on that. If that's something that. No, definitely. Um, I think text is a great option. Um, and I also think maybe the best thing is, to, you know, just to have a conversation, just what's the best way for us to communicate with you. Um, everybody's going to be a little bit different, but also with this whole coronavirus stuff, I think the, um, the utilization of technology and tools has really just been catapulted, uh, catapulted forward. You know, Zoom has made it a lot more easy and accessible. You can just send someone a link. All they have to do is click on it. The meeting's open. Yeah. You guys can talk face to face. Almost as good as if you're in person. It's never, never going to be the same. Um, but to, you know, you can you can share screens. You can show people what to do. Uh, you, you know, you can take control of their screen and make it really, really easy. To, um, and like I said, almost like you were there, but not quite. Um, as but if you're the one to- doing it, I think that's the key you're getting right to it. Is like, it's you as the advisor. So too many advisors, I think, find this, well, I'll let yeah. the record keeper handle it. Just, you call, the, they literally just deal with the business owner and then kind of move on to the next one. But if you can find a way to like, you be the face of the actual advice, through technology, through emails and videos and all those different ways, even if you got them all in like a group somehow or like, however, they have to communicate somehow in the business. So there's gotta be a way you can get into that whole ecosystem. And if you're the one doing it, I think you're gonna see some real success, but how to scale that's always the struggle, I think for an advisor. Is always the struggle. We have been doing um, 15 minute Zoom calls with, with the people that we've been working with. And sometimes we'll do group Zoom calls as well. Uh, and um, yeah, and we've got a lot of technology that's been coming out too. So we're always pivoting. We're always keeping our eye on what's going to be the easiest way, uh, but also just having that conversation. What's going to be the best way for you guys for for us to communicate with you and and kind of meeting them where they're at. Is, yeah, is I love that. Yeah, and then and then you talked about plan design. So let's dive into that real quick because I think that's key in every single space is knowing how to help business owners design their plan for now. And then like going forward, because mm-hmm. to I mean, too many 401k advisors just leave it and they don't ever revisit design. And so how do you approach plan design for like construction? Let's say like a, a subcontractor, uh, I don't even know whatever industry, like framers or whatever, like how would you approach that? Let's say you got a, business owner he's got 50 guys on different job sites what what how are you going to walk through that process take take me through what that looks like yeah that's a great question um i think to start with you know really just having the conversation of what do you want to get out of this plan and and plan design is interesting because like you said you know it's not going to be the same for every industry and let's even say you're in the same industry business owners within the same industry that do the exact same work are going to have completely different ideas and goals for really what they want out of their plan whether that be you know i'm trying to i really just want to take care of my employees i these guys are family to me i want to give back to them i want to provide a really solid um, place for them to save their money maybe that's your goal maybe your goal is to as the owner put away just as absolutely much as you can and really maximize your contributions to the plan as well as the company's contributions to your own account um, Maybe it is, maybe it's, you know, just, uh, well, I guess I've kind of touched on, so you want your owners to save, you want uh, the employees to be able to save and you want to be able to attract and grow. Um, I guess the last one might be, you know, hey, let's, where can we save on taxes? We're getting beat up on taxes and um, yeah. how do we, how do we tax strategy. that? Um, so really just kind of what are the goals of the company? And then based off those kind of goals, all right, now we're going to put a plan in place that, that really helps you achieve those. Yeah. So you kind of split it up. I mean, as far as like culture goals, like they care. I mean, there's a lot of mentoring going on, I think in the construction world where they really care about their guys they are trying to support them. They know that they, they want to help them be successful, 
then there's the tax side, right? They're, if they're in good times, they're making so much money, they got to figure out how to shelter some of that. And a lot of times their accountant isn't going to be proactive and actually strategic to tell them how. And the 401k could be one really, really good way to do it in a way that the money that would go to the IRS, they can actually give to their, their team. You know, their guys and gals that are working for them, which when you help do the math for them, just by getting some data and saying, this is what would happen, you can start to paint a picture for them. That's what I found. And, and from there, you can go down the path of, all right, which kind of plan design do we need to go with? Because sure. depending on which one's most important, you're going to need to determine safe harbor or not. Because sometimes just saying safe harbor is not really the answer, especially in the construction industry. If you're trying to retain people and you want to do a six year vest, you're, if you do safe harbor, you're stuck. Right. So um, I think that understanding that first key point, I think you're totally right. Knowing the, the ultimate goal, but then being able to talk them through designs. So like for a scenario, for example, let's say the business owner wants to, to fully put a, everything he can, he or she can into the plan. That to me is like immediately, like we got to go safe harbor, right? Like, I don't know another way to do it um, effectively if, because you're probably not going to get the same participation without safe harbor. So you're going to have to get past those tests. So when you do that, then you start to talk about the other the four safe harbor designs, you know, basically and go down the path of you. How do you, how do you, how do you explain safe harbor to someone? I mean, how, when someone says, yep, I want to as a business owner go talk me through what you would do in those steps. And let's discuss that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So safe harbor really at its simplest form is, is just a way to pass testing. And the reason that you would have issues with passing testing is because you as an owner, um, and this is, we see this a lot in the construction industry, the owner's making a ton of money. He's got a, a rank and file staff that are, you know, they're paid hourly, whatever that may be. And yeah. because he is typically at a, making a little bit more money, he's wanting to save a lot more. But um, with 401k plans, they, they make sure that the plan uh, treats everybody the exact same. And so the owners, if they're saving too much into the plan, then they'll fail testing. They'll have to have those contributions taken back out of the plan. It's usually a mess and frustrating for the owners. And so Safe Harbor is simply just a way for you to automatically pass testing. There's a couple uh, holes or loops that you got to jump through to, to have that happen. Mainly it's that they want you to um, contribute from the company. They want you to match your employees a certain amount. There's a couple different styles that you can use. Um, so within that, you can figure out which one's going to be best, uh, which one's going to best help you achieve the goals for the company. Um, but yeah, basically safe harbor is just a way for the owners to really maximize their contributions. If the rank and file employees are not um, participating as much as they should be to pass testing otherwise. Right. Yeah, no, that's, it, yeah, I think that's a good point. Safe Harbor, because I've seen plans where they fail top heavy and they didn't know. And then that's a big check to write, you know, the penalty 3% to everybody that's eligible. That can be a hefty, hefty thing to work your way through. And completely um, avoidable if, if it's. Yeah, if it's designed right. That's the thing. If someone had actually been proactive and helped them, that's the key. That's why you know that industry. And I would say even with basically the early things you said about auto enroll, talk about a Quacka plan, which you've been talking about on social media. I think, I think for most construction companies, that makes a ton of sense if they, if they communicate well, right? Because you don't want to do auto enroll if they don't communicate well. But when you do Quacka, which is the Qualified Automatic Contribution Arrangement, you get a two-year vest schedule, which I think can really kind of best of both worlds, you know, fit in safe harbor, but also keep the keep their team around a little longer. So having a good advisor like yourself understanding their business and coaching them through those things can literally save them so much money and probably more frustration than anything. Oh, if they sign up with their payroll team or like, you know, just get sold a crap 401k design that by somebody who doesn't really know anything about them. I mean, that's, that's where the value is really could be for you to help them out. So, yeah. But then on the flip side, what if there's a business owner that doesn't want to participate? I mean, if, so, if I meet somebody that's like, no, I, uh, I do other things, I do real estate, I do other stuff, I don't want to do the 401k, changes it completely. 
like you take safe harbor totally off the off my mind completely because it's not going to be an issue right and i have a lot of those opportunities that come across my desk that i'm like that's fine let's let's just do a discretionary plan let's leave it open and then it's a very different i think approach to communication as far as what they're going to do and and you see a variety of different results that way uh it's probably not as successful sometimes um but it just every everyone's a little different so i think setting the expedition up front like you're doing is is really smart um because you can set the goals based on what they tell you and then come back and report on how that how you did helping them get there you know what i'm saying so yeah it's really yeah. kind of that that's the pivotal point Sorry, sure. And in that situation, even if the owner is doing something else, if he doesn't see the value or probably does see the value if he is doing a 401k at all, but if it's not something that he's going to be maxing out, then it still just goes back to, okay, so what do you want? To, what are your ultimate goals with the plan? Are you wanting to help the company save on taxes? Do you want to really just provide an awesome service for your employees to retire with? Um, are you trying to attract new people? Um, whatever that is, then, then you can go to town on on plan design and maybe it's not safe harbor maybe it's not quacka but there are still a lot of things that you can do within the plan design to to really help um help achieve those goals yeah totally yeah and then i think after you kind of get that plan design discussion figured out knowing which providers i think are a good fit could be key as far as record keeping because i know from my experience that i don't speak spanish i took four years of spanish in college or not college high school I never got thrown into the actual having to speak it. So I never really made that whole jump in, but I constantly run into that issue where I don't speak Spanish and I need to. Right. And so I, I'm trying to always balance that and get an interpreter. And it, it's just hard. So um, I found that other, some record keepers do a really good job with that setting and but there's other things to look at too, as far as like how long it went on hold. I mean, there's just so many factors. So I think narrowing down that, that whole record keeping list for this niche could be really, really important to help eliminate a lot of frustrating people, frustrated people that maybe don't speak English or maybe don't have laptops or computers, you know, just, they, they just want to call in like, um, so have you found some record keepers that you like better than others in this space that, and, and why, why, why those ones? If you do, have you have any, maybe you haven't, I don't know. Yeah. So we really like, we like working with unified trusts. Um, we like working with Pentegra. Uh, Boy is also awesome. There's a lot of really good, great, great record keepers. Um, and I mean, as far as the businesses go, that's not something that they ever really want to deal with. Right. So that's as the advisors, that's really our job to understand the, the, the industry, the market, and kind of where these guys really excel, what what industries and what markets they excel in. Um, and we're really looking, I, the reason that we kind of gravitate to these guys is they, they do an awesome job with the compliance of running these plans, with the oversight of them, with making stuff really frictionless for the employees, making the experience really, really good for the employees. So. Um, yeah. There's a lot of studies and research that's going on right now in the 401k industry on how do we design these websites so that so that when a participant logs on, they are making the appropriate decisions. They're not just logging on and saying, oh my gosh, it's too complicated, I can't do this. Or even if they do go through the process, they're, they're making the right elections, they're getting into the right investments. Um, and there's a lot of work on our end and the record keepers end that really um, can have a huge impact on you know, the outcome of someone that let's say they get into a retirement plan right now. And just because of the way the website was designed, um, five, 10, 15 years down the road, they're, they're on track, they're killing it, they're where they should be, or they're at least close. And they, they're able to, to get on and see, hey, I am on track, or I'm not on track. And what do I need to do different to, to get me on track? Um, so people that really, you know, put a huge emphasis, record keepers that put a huge emphasis on that. Um, and those are the people that we typically tend to gravitate towards. But this, again, this, this industry, this marketplace is continually changing as well as the needs of your company are continually changing. And so as advisors, that's really kind of our job 
is to understand what's out there. What are your options when you for the for the 401k, and what are your needs for the company? And we're you know we're able to put those two together in a way that makes the most sense. And obviously, that's going to continually change. So it's our job to stay on top of it and and yeah, to I totally agree. Service. Yeah, because it's it's never going to end. That's the point I think to make there is that a good record keeping solution for you now may change. And when you really look at the pricing, when you break it apart, you actually see what you're paying for. And there's no hidden stuff going on with the funds. You, the big brands, the ones we all know are pretty close on price. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can get them most, most, the most common is asset based, right? But then other times it's flat fee, which is what I'm going a lot to because medical plans are a lot high dollar value. The higher the asset fee, it's going to go up way too much for them. So I'm trying to get it flat, keep it low for your space. Like asset based fees still would be probably a good fit because it would be cheaper for them with lower average account balances. Um, but it all depends. Like you said, like I don't, I don't use all those same record keepers, but I've used a couple of them for sure. Um, and, and that's why I think each niche kind of, you know what you need to bring to the table as far as technology, um, enrollment experience. I mean, some of, some of them charge for kits or, you know, packets, which I think is crazy. I, I, a lot of times I don't even use those at all. Even if they provide them, I just make a one pager and <laughs> tell everybody, you know, here's your waiting period, your, your eligibility, eligibility entry, your, your match, and then your vesting schedule and then how to get a hold of me. So, um, like, a lot of times those big, huge booklets are overkill, especially in your niche. People are just, they don't, it's too much for them. But sometimes they provide them in Spanish too. So I, that's, that's the whole other side of it. So I think you're right to make yourself the person that the really, everything flows through. So I like that. That's cool. Yeah, and I wanted to, I guess let's go back and touch on the huge yeah, elephant in the room, if you will, for the 401k space. And it's been, it's in lots of conversations at this point, but fees for plans that are easily the he the biggest headwind that you'll run into as a participant for really just being able to have as much the money that you need in retirement. Um, and so it's really important if, if you're going to be working with an advisor to select an advisor that's going to have their eye on fees the entire time. They're not going to be, you know, they don't let these unnecessary fees get into the plan. Uh, there, this this industry if for the longest time has been really good at charging fees that are unnecessary, bearing them in paperwork that you really can't see. Um, True. Advisors like yourself, that's one of the things I absolutely you love about you is you really uh, you put together really good plans and you do stuff that matters. You do stuff that you're making stuff simple. You're making stuff uh, cheap. Or I don't necessarily want to say cheap, but reasonable. Yeah, like in line, but not afraid to go through the work to get there. I think that's the key part is too many advisors leave it because it's like, oh, it's disruption. You know, it's only a few thousand bucks, but a few thousand bucks okay. is like, if you saw a thousand bucks on the ground, you pick it up. Why would you not go through a little bit of a change, a new login to save that money? And it's, it's going to be residual every single year. So yeah, fees are coming down because technology is getting better. I think that it's understanding. We're not just trying to undercut everybody else. We're actually trying to use technology to be more places with less cost. And we pass those savings on to the client. It's that simple, you know? So, and that's what record keepers need to do. Like record keepers that have these huge marketing budgets, back off that and stop traveling so much and buying, you know, putting your name everywhere for branding. I get the value there, but like, at certain points, you know, let's save, let's put some savings towards the client <laughs> and that's what they're going to have to do, you know? So it's interesting. It's, it's quite a changing like marketplace in my opinion, like it's constantly evolving. And if the client themselves had to keep up with all that, they would never, they would never be able to know what's going on. There's just too much. They would be so distracted from their business. So that's why I really, really focus niche advisor like you that has their heart, you know, finger on the heartbeat of what is going on for them is so worth it in, in a lot of ways that, you know, you could pay more or the same price somewhere else and they, they wouldn't have a clue what they're doing. They're just, 
treating it like a passive business side of their, their book. So yeah, fees are tough. I think they're just going to keep going down <laughs> Yes. as much as you want to add just the add value and justify a higher fee. You know, let's, let's look where we actually are adding value and um, you know, and, and I think the asset based model for an advisor still makes sense. So differentiating that from, you know, from record keeping where they, how many people they have, they send those many statements out. They're doing that many trades, that many phone calls. It's kind of a per head thing, not really based on assets, but having an advisor based on assets, we take a hit when the market took a hit in March, our fees were lower. Like we got hit for the whole quarter because at the end of the quarter, we got collected our fee and that sucks. But so is seeing their account balance so low in the end of March. Right? So it's, there's a balance there to try and figure out how do you, how do you structure that fee schedule? Um, and it very well may need to be a per head thing in the construction space. And I think that's probably something to explore. I don't know. I, I haven't, I've tried it a little bit in the past. What are your thoughts? Are you still doing an asset based fee model? Yeah. So we are asset based. Um, and I, I, you know, we're always looking at it. We're always looking at what's going to make the most sense. Um, for our clients as well as for us. Um, again, back, you know, we're a firm believer that the fees that you pay are really just, they're gonna be the biggest headwind that you face in getting your investment returns. And so our whole idea is how do we, how do we keep the fees as low as possible? Um, and that's a huge, huge consideration for us when we're building these plans. And then as we continue to review existing plans that we have. Do you have like a minimum fee, like for a startup plan, do you have like a base fee? Or you just charge an asset fee still? You know, right now it's still just an asset fee. Um, again, that's something that we're we're continuing to look at, and that might change in the future. Uh, but for right now, yeah, even for a startup plan, it's just going to be a, a, a fee based. Which, yeah, I think it's it's based. more in the client's favor for sure in that setting because um, when you do the math, even if it's whatever, I think our fee schedule starts at 70 basis points, even if 70 basis points of zero, zero. So like, um, it's in your favor as a client to hire the right person and do your due diligence up front and then treating that relationship for the long term, like keeping it for the long term. Because bouncing around advisor to advisor is probably not going to be the best solution. Having the right advisor in place, and then possibly changing the other service providers on the road is a way better move. In my opinion, even though advisor, I know it's like sounds crazy, but like, that's, I think a smarter, keep that a steady position. Um, but you got to pick the right one. And if they start slacking and just treating you like a residual income passive model, then you got to dump them. You got to move. And that's where I think, um, having a specialist in your area really helps a ton. So, well, cool. Well, do you want to add anything else? We can kind of wrap it up. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Okay. Well, thanks, Nate. I think anybody in, uh, you know, in the construction space, whether, I mean, that's broad still, but it's narrowed down into one space. Are you going, you're covering just Utah? Are you going outside of Utah? Where are you taking clients? Uh, if it makes sense for, for us and the right client, I'm happy to work with them pretty much wherever. Uh, I really focus a lot of my energy here in Utah, uh, just cause that's where I live and, and, uh, but yeah, we're happy to work with anybody that would like to talk to us. Um, yeah, if they're if you're okay with tech, obviously that's going to work. If you want in person, probably Utah's uh, a better fit. So you're not flying all over. You know, you like to to fly. I know we'll get a, we'll get into that another another video one day. day. Um, maybe you could do a Zoom meeting from. Is it wait? Is it paragliding? Hang paragliding. Glide. Yeah, we could, do, we could do a Zoom video from the sky, probably. <laughs> that would be awesome. We'll do that next time. <laughs> okay. All right. So if you're in construction, you've been wondering about 401ks, or you uh, have had a bad experience and want a better experience, hit Nate up. He's he's one of, one of the all-stars, I think, in Utah that is going to just continue to help more clients. And I'm excited because... I like my niche. I like medical. And so I don't necessarily want to work with construction companies. So I'm sending them to Nate. So we're in the same industry as far as geographically, but I think that's, what's fun about this is we're not treating each other as like competitors. We're actually trying to help each other. I think that's great. And I want to see more of that. So 
Um, I'm glad we've we've been able to connect and get to know each other better, Nate. It's been fun. Um, Let's get summer going. Yeah. And uh, we'll do more of these. We'll do this regular thing. Sweet. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Uh-huh.